Hello, welcome to the latest edition of Rugby League Back Chat from the LD Nutrition Stadium in Feverson. Rugby League Challenge Cup fever has been and gone another month to the main final. However, we've got plenty to talk about between now and then. Starting with this week, we have three very special guests joining us. Starting with Rugby League legal guru Richard Kramer, Leeds Rhinos Women's Challenge Cup winner Danica Prim, I'm sure she likes the sound of that, and BBC broadcaster Tim Steer. Thank you everyone for joining us. Danica, I'm going to come straight to you. How's the last few days been? I'm sure you and the rest of the girls are on cloud nine after your victory. Yeah, it's just been incredible. Um, I think obviously Saturday was just out of this world and then the, the fallout from that and the amount of kind of interest that's got into the, the team and into the women's game has just been incredible. So it, it, yeah, we are still completely buzzing. The the game itself, you went in as huge underdogs really. Cass have yeah. been flying this year, I haven't lost a game. It didn't look like that on the field. It was tight and nervy, but you, you wedged them. Were you, did you surprise yourselves that you beat them or did you always go in knowing that you know you, you can beat them? I mean, you, you were the holders at the end of the day. Yeah, I think Challenge Cup's a really weird thing, isn't it? Like we saw Halifax at the weekend, they shouldn't have been there. But yeah, we went in, I think a few weeks ago, we lost 27-0 to Cass, mainly due to our performance rather than theirs. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a great squad and stuff. But yeah, we knew that we had it in us. Um, I wouldn't say we were, were worried, we knew that we had to play well, and obviously it's a Challenge Cup final, isn't it? That's what you want. Um, but we had a really great run up to the to the final in training. Uh, Cuthbert was doing a great job in kind of making us focus just on our game and what we were doing. And we worked really heavily in defence, which on Saturday, uh, I think, basically won us the game. What was the occasion like? Because from an outsider's perspective, the whole build up, the game itself, the way it was treated seemed to be on a different level, a different scale to last year. It was unreal. I, mm. I, I still now, I, I can't think, I can't really put it into words. You know, we spoke to our to our younger girls and the girls that hadn't been in the final before and said, look, this is a big occasion. It, you know, sometimes it throws people off. But then we got there, we were like, whoa, like <laughs> this is next level occasion. Um, you know, from walking out the tunnels with the fire, the guard of honour, um, to being streamed on the BBC, you know, to uh, having all of the, you know, it, watching it back, it's kind of weird for us because we're, you know, we watch the men's game quite a lot, but it was like we're kind of watching the same as a men's game here, but it's not, it's us. Mm. And then, you know, afterwards and the whole celebrations, the trophies, the fallout from it was just incredible. And, and we're still kind of like running off on this kind of cloud nine mm -hmm. about how fantastic it was. Tim, it was good to watch. The coverage was up tenfold on last year, really. How pivotal a moment do you think this was for the women's game? There's been a lot of pivotal moments in the last year or so, but how big was this one? I think this was a, a crowning moment really for the women's game in the sense mm -hmm. that Danica's mentioned there that the, the production values and the coverage, the mm -hmm. TV coverage was much the same as the men. The whole stadium, the atmosphere, things like the yeah. cannons going off, everything just built up to it being just like any other big rugby league match. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be seen now is that women's matches like this, women's Challenge Cup final should be seen as big as any other game. So I think mm -hmm. it was a, a defining moment maybe for the women's game there that hopefully it can kick on and move forward from here. Hey Richard, we talk about making events out of rugby league. It seems to me that on Saturday, the inclusion of, of the women's game and the, the nature of the two semi-finals, rugby, without trying to sound too positive, rugby league was the winner, wasn't it, on Saturday, really? Yeah, and um, you know, I think what's very pleasing is is that I think now there seems to be recognition of the women's game, mm -hmm. and that's commensurate with what we're seeing in football. So the Women's World Cup was a huge success. Um, huge numbers viewing. Uh, we're now seeing cricket, uh, England versus Australia, and um, I think we've come of age now. I think you know, reality is is uh, as Tim said, it's a sort of it's a defining moment, and I think you know, the women's um, part of rugby league can be very proud of yourself, and I, and I think rather than feel a little bit perhaps an inferiority complex, or you know, are we just gate crashing, or do we really belong here? I think now, you know, you're part, part of the game and it can only get better and bigger. Uh, and um, I think it's going to be a huge success going forward. And uh, I think this is just the start of something very, very exciting. In, in all honesty, look, the Women's Super League came in, it's been massive and I'd say a huge success. But has there been that little bit of, uh, are, we, are we really a part of this at times? I know Leeds have been fantastic with the way that they've, how that inclusive they've been as a club. But in general, has, it, has there been that, attitude that feeling amongst the girls um it, well yes and no for you know like saturday was phenomenal and our and our kind of thought process now is they set the start the, the bar really really high on saturday um come the, the grand final will it be on the same level will it be better where do you go from here now because 
that kind of apart from being you know attracting bigger crowds and bigger sponsors and you know getting all of the financial side of it I'm not sure how much bigger you can go than Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the, there are obviously little bits and pieces. And in terms of leads, we couldn't ask any more. Uh, aside from the fact that we're still amateur in the sense that we don't get paid, mm -hmm. we have everything that the men have. So we train at the same place, um, strength and conditioning, psychological help, nutritional help, um, got physios and doctors and all the medical side of things. And then we've got people in the Super League that don't get the same support from their clubs, mm -hmm. whether, you know, the financial buy-in or whether the clubs just don't buy in. Uh, so we play York and, you know, York are still a relative new club to the Super League and they don't get half of the financial backing that we get. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, it's more on the fact that how do you make the Super League more of a level playing field for everybody in it? Do, does there need to be a criteria? But then we don't have the talent pool for that. Yeah. You know, we've seen Warrington, they've, they're in the championship and they're quite likely to come up to the Super League next season. Um, and they're getting backed by Warrington as a club. So, but, you know, the talent pool maybe for and they're out on the edge so they don't have as many players you know so I, it's quite a hard you know we are trying to set the standard and for some part of it you know the guys at Leeds Ryan though so that the lads that play they're wholeheartedly accept us you know we're part mm -hmm. of one club we do like events together we do player appearances together yeah. you know we walk past them and you say hi how are you doing it's not like you know I'm, I'm an out and out Leeds Rhinos fan I always have been and now I'm walking past the players and you know in the, the train and just going hi how are you doing how was your weekend you know yeah, yeah. and it's insane like that's only in the last year, really. But then, so on that side, yeah, we are moving and growing. But how do we keep it? You know, Tom Brindle at the RFL is doing a phenomenal job and he's really championing our game. And he's the one that's kind of moved the trophies, trophies up in line. He's got, you know, George Roach's Woman of Steel trophy mm -hmm. was just on par with the, the Man of Steel. So there are parts of it. It's just, it bitty, is that the right word to use? Mm. Um, it's just trying to find that level playing field to all go forward at the same pace and at the same time. Tim, in, in your perspective, we saw the coverage on, on Saturdays. I think we all agree it was fantastic. Where's the future for the women's game in terms of broadcasting, in terms of how we can get it on TV more? Our league's obviously been big. Is there anywhere else we can take it on an even bigger scale than that, do you think? Is there potential for it? Yeah, the potential for the, the game is no doubt massive, as Richard has already mentioned, with like the Lionesses this summer. The, there is that public support. There is definitely that opinion now that the, the women's game should be broadcast wider in that sense. The online service I think the BBC provided for the Women's Challenge Cup final is very good. Maybe that's something that you could look into more because online is definitely the future in lots of regards in terms of broadcasting. So there is that possibility there. I don't know if this guy could offer a service like that as well, maybe to start off with and then see mm -hmm. how it can progress from there. I know there's talk about Channel 4 maybe coming in with the championship in the men's game. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a, there's a possibility of, of a deal to be done there. There's, there's many different ways now that you can broadcast any kind of sport really. So you can't say there's, there's no excuse for them not to be able to have a, a possibility or an opportunity of broadcasting somewhere. Uh, just quickly, Danica, this pact, it's been uh, the talk of social media ever since you won. You're going to have to fill us in on what has happened and uh, what it was all about, please. Long story short, <laughs> Seb Robinson, our centre, is, uh, is ditching us and moving to Australia at the end of August. And all right for some. Yeah, moving to Melbourne. And um, so it's essentially Saturday was her last final. She's not going to be in, you know, she, she might come back and come back to Leeds, but for the near future, that was our last final. And obviously going in as underdogs, we were sat on, on Wednesday. We'd had a good training session, you know, we, the sun was shining. We're not having drinks, you know, we're trying to prep for a final. So she's a bit like, oh, right, if we win, I'm getting a tattoo done of this phrase that we all use. Well, I think Adam brought the phrase in of, um, <laughs> yeah, the girls, but we haven't, we haven't got that. We've got an abbreviated version of that. So basically okay. she went, yeah. If we win, I'm going to get it. So Shabu's and I were there. We went, yeah, yeah, fine. Training on Thursday, we have this massive inspirational speech from Jamie Peacock. At the end of it, I'm like, girls, me, Sophie and Shara getting a tattoo if we win. Who's in? Next thing you know, <laughs> everybody who is of the legal age uh, and willing is uh, now branded for life. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> well, uh, I wonder if either St. Helens or Warrington have any plans for that, gents, because they're obviously in the final. We'll start on Warrington Hall. Um, oh, what a game that was, Tim. That was a, just a belter, wasn't it? Yeah, fantastic game. Some fantastic tries in it as well, even though Hollacy were on the losing side in the end. The, the mm -hmm. try for Beretta Farayuma on the left corner. Now Long goes run down that right-hand side on the outside edge. It was absolutely phenomenal. Then the cross-field kick as well mm -hmm. from Albert Kelly. There, there were some classy tries in that game, really. Both teams contributed to a fantastic occasion. But I think in the end, it was the halfback play 
from debt pattern and from soon to be possibly England halfback Blake Austin, <laughs> but I won't open that can of worms. Yeah. But they controlled the game for Warrington and they were, they were dominant in that sense and that proved to be the difference in the end, I think. Richard, I, Warrington have been a little bit patchy for the last couple of months, but they've put the money into the big players, the big players stepped up, didn't they, when they needed them to? Yeah, they're an enigma, Warrington. You just never know what you're going to get. Um, you know, you look at their team, you look at the squad, probably pound for pound, you might even say the best team on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they fail to deliver uh, and they underperform. Um, I've got huge admiration for the coach, Steve Price. I think he has bought into the Warrington culture. I think he's bought into the English culture. You know, he loves, you could see that, you know, the love of the Challenge Cup. And the, you know, the Australians have got huge respect for the Challenge Cup and you saw that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hull were very, were very good. Um, you know, I think if Warrington would have been slightly off and have been slightly off the last few weeks, I think Hull could have nicked it. But um, Warrington came good. Um, they'd been in a slight slump of form, a bit unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always that, you just never know with Warrington. And even in the final, you know, they could turn up and be magnificent or they could just lie down. We just don't know. But um, I think it's good for the game because um, they've, Warrington have put a huge investment in, not just in terms of the playing squad, but what they're doing off the field yeah. as well. And I think that's just rewards for all the people that work behind the scenes there. And Warrington have, have probably embraced sort of 29 Super League and the new beginnings and everything else probably better than any other team. It's a, it's a fair point as well because as you say, I don't think many would argue that in terms of social media and everything that they've tried to do, they have been the best. What would it, what would it do for Super League and for the game itself if Warrington, who we know, God knows what they'd do if they actually won the Challenge Cup, but if they were to get that trophy? Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, it, it's, I always think 50-50 on a final like this, and yeah, they go in as underdogs, everybody will fancy St. Helens, and maybe that might suit Warrington a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, because I think in the past they probably tend to be more favourites. A lot depends on what injuries both teams can avoid in the next few weeks. Um, I, it's difficult to tell, depends on the conditions as well, but um, I think you know, certainly for people like Simon Moran, who's put huge investment not mm -hmm. into Warrington but in the game generally, you know, he probably deserves that, um, and he's probably fed up of leading his team out, <laughs> which is a great occasion for him, and then yeah. fi finding he's in the losers' changing room. But uh, but listen, you, you know, St Helens are the form team at the moment. You'd have to think they were favourites, but I think that will suit suit Warrington. Um, and you can never tell. You know, in a, I was thinking a eighty minute. As Danica found out, you know, Leeds were underdogs, weren't they, against Castleford? Uh, you can never tell in a final. And I think sometimes it suits the underdog. I'm sure you played on that, Danica, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, of course, yeah. Being underdog, you know. I think we were the holders of the Challenge Cups, so therefore everyone said we went into pressure trying to retain it. But you forget about last year. We've just lost 27-0 to a, to a team. Yeah, of course. You know, we're going to go in as underdogs. But, yeah, pressure's not on you, is it? So, yeah. Uh, everyone loves an underdog. I think the problem this season as well is that, that you can't predict anything as far as any team is concerned. Bar St Helens, <laughs> yeah. any fixture you think, I have no idea because everybody is so inconsistent in that sense. Yeah. So who knows, Warrington may suddenly go from being rock to a diamond and, and beat St Helens. Well, speaking of underdogs, how about Halifax? Hey, let's be honest, did anyone think that they'd make it a contest at all? Probably not. I think Bookies had it at like minus 44. I think most people had it about minus 70. What a performance, Richard. Um, the conditions suited them. Obviously, it was a, it was a, a wet pitch. Uh, it rained a lot, so it, it kind of slowed things down. But I just, I watched it, and what you could just see is this, right, this is our final, and we're just mm -hmm. going to enjoy it. And they were just celebrating every major tackle, every one ball. Mm -hmm. And do you know what's fantastic is that I think... Even Halifax, who have not necessarily been right at the top of the championship, they've been there or thereabouts, top four. But they've proved, actually, that the gulf is not as enormous as we think. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if you looked at middle eights, which we've seen in the last few years, you know, we have seen you know, championship teams beat Super League mm -hmm. teams, which I don't think was ever really predicted. But now you, what you've seen is you know, a team kind of third, fourth, whatever, fifth in, in the championship can compete against St Helens, obviously, albeit in a one-off match. But they were there or thereabouts in the game. And I think the championship and Halifax can be very proud of what they've achieved. Tim, a big big win for Halifax, even though they're on the wrong side of the sky. And what about the championship? I mean, 
we've, we champion it a lot about how good it was, but when all said and done, this is a team currently in the bottom half of the championship, going up against the runaway leaders of Super League, and they gave them a right game. Incredible, really. Also, you bear in mind the fact that Halifax are a completely part-time team as well, mm. so you've got <coughs> other teams in that division that are full-time and could maybe give even more of a test in that mm -hmm. sense of, of games between Championship and Super League sides. But I, I'm with Rich in the sense of why shouldn't they be celebrating every tackle, every knock-on they've made? Because let's face it, St Helens are the runaway team in this country at the moment. So if you can force an error from them and, and keep the game as tight as you can, I'd be celebrating for sure. And just, we'll move on to St Helens after the break, but just quickly on Halifax Dunnecker. I mean, some of the shots they were putting on as well, they, they weren't messing about, were they? Was it the time they? get a shot on Elmer? Oh, yes. he made what a lot of friends absolute. with that one, didn't he? Yeah, I, that's what I mean. You just champion everything. The pure mm. passion. Do you know, some of these lads are walking out and looking at like, I want not their idols as such, but they're playing against like guys that they look up to, you know, yeah. part-time players from a little village, so to speak, playing against the out and out, you know, runaway kind of leaders of the of the game at the minute. Why wouldn't you celebrate every single tackle mm. and every single knock on or error, you know? And that was pure passion and heart that got them through that game, I think. Good on Halifax. Well, after the break, we will indeed talk about St. Helens and Justin Holbrook's future as he looks for a move to the NRL. We'll be right back. You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Welcome back to Rugby League Back Chat. Don't forget, you can join the conversation too on Twitter at RL Back Chat. But for now, I'm going to ask these three people, these three guests, what they think about the world of rugby league. We're going to go on to Saints, Tim. Um, look, I think Halifax was maybe the story, but realistically, Saints were the big winners. They've got to Wembley, finally, first time in 11 years. Don't think the result was ever in doubt, was it? Didn't matter to them. They just got the win. How, how impressed were you with them? Yeah, obviously Halifax were going to make it very tough for them because we know that they were going to put absolutely everything they've got into every single tackle. And in a way, there was a bit more pressure on the Saints because there was an expectation that they were going to put 50, 60, whatever on Halifax in that mm -hmm. game. So they knew they had to win it. They had to get the job done and get over the line. And even though it was tough in the end for them, I think it showed another side to Saints that maybe we haven't seen this season because they've been getting through teams quite easily. Mm -hmm. But Halifax really put up a really fight, you know, a real stern test and a real fight for them. And they managed to, to show a bit of grit and determination to get over the line. Richard, the, like I said, they never really looked like losing. But if it had gone in at 2 all, it might have been a little bit nervy. I guess that helps when you've got a master at, at the Rookies, like James Roby. How, how important yeah. is he for them? Well, I just, you know, he's not been playing a lot, has he? He's been injured. And, um, you know, I, I talk a lot to Ellery Hanley because he's chairman of Man of Steel. And, uh, you know, you always sort of... Roby always gets mentioned. You know, he's probably the most consistent player in the game. He, he's just, he just does everything right. But it, it's probably what the way I would describe it is: is he makes less errors than probably any other player in the competition. <laughs> yeah. So that just makes him a great player. And and he he gave having him present, uh, you know, gives them a big lift. And they're going to need experience at Wembley. I, I didn't realize that fact that they hadn't played there for eleven years, even though they've had great success. Um, and then you're going, to get, you're going to get the Holbrook factor now, aren't you? So, you know, if the rumours are true, mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, you're going to get that probably a bit of siege mentality, aren't you? Sort of going in, you know, I think, I think they'll want to win the Challenge Cup and I think they'll want to win the Grand Final as well. Uh, on paper, they are probably the, the, the best team. Um, they are the form team at the moment. Um, but I say, you know, I've said before, it's, I think it's a 50-50 game, but mm -hmm. I think that edge now with Holbrook potentially on his e on, exiting out 
we'll, we'll want to do it for him. We'll uh, talk about Holbrook in just a minute. Just on the Saints, look, Danica, they, there's no doubt they're a great team. I think many people in the build-ups, they said they're probably the best Super League team in 10 years. Can they go down as that until they win a trophy? <sighs> you know, it's their form, isn't it? And it comes down to the, the consistency you've been speaking about and they are the most consistent. But I think going down to Wembley, like you say, it's been such a long time for them to get there. Warrington were, you know, the bridesmaid, so to speak, last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think they need to be tested with a big occasion to just to really see how consistent and how good they are. And, and Wembley's going to be just that because, you know, there's a lot of pressure now on the fact that it's taken such a long time to get there and can they can they deal with the build up? Can they deal with all of the, you know, the Holbrook situation? Is that, a, a, you know, an added bonus or is it a hindrance? And the fact that mm -hmm. what is to come, what is next for them? If, if, if it was you, and let's put you in, in Saints shoes, if you knew that Adam Cuthbertson was leaving at the end of the year, what would the mentality of the players be? Would it be a distraction or would it would it give you that siege mentality? No, it probably it would be, let's do it for Adam type of, type mm -hmm. of uh, go forward and um, but at the same time, I don't know whether how it affects players in terms of yeah. the publicity, the the media, the the build up around it. Because what we you know we don't get very much of it, so mm -hmm. we get to concentrate on our game quite a lot. Yeah. But I can imagine that the the clubs and at that level, there's going to be a lot of pressure on what's next, what's next. Are, are you settled? You know, are you comfortable mm -hmm. with what's going on? So, and then just that added bonus of it's taken eleven years. Don't don't fail now. Well, Tim, I think you're the best person to answer this question for us. There is going to be a lot of talk in the build-up to St. Helens. Look, before this, it was six semi-final defeats. They've got over that now, but they still haven't got that trophy under Justin Holbrook. They've lost three semi-finals under him already. How big a distraction could that be for the players? How will that play into their mindset mentally leading into a, a final with the chance to get one of the big major trophies? I think we one of those where it's something that the media like to talk about a lot. And I think mm. it, the media will constantly remind the players, you know, well, you've got close as a club in the past, but you've not got over the line, have you? So even if they try to forget it, I think they'll be constantly reminded. And that'll be another battle for them in that sense, because you're right, Saints have always been the bridesmaid and never really the bride. And unfortunately, in terms of history and how good teams are judged in, in the history of the game, it's whether you win trophies. It's not necessarily if you finished top of the table at the end of the regular season, did you come away with the big one? So it, it's going to be a bit of a pressure for them. But with that added, added extra factor of, of Justin Holbrook looking like he's going to be leaving uh, at the end of the season as well, that siege mentality may be the difference. It could actually be a key factor this time. So let's go on to Justin Holbrook. Um, Gold Coast bound, I think that's almost certain, Richard. I mean, a loss for Saints, a loss for Super League as well, though, because they've, they've been fantastic under him, haven't they? Yeah, and uh, you know, listen, you know, the fact that he's being attracted back to the NRL because I think nobody really heard of him when he came over. I think he was an assistant. Um, he, was, he was working with the Australian schoolboys, I seem to recall. Yeah, yeah. and you know, credit to uh, you know Eamon and the board and Mike Rush there for for spotting somebody who had no pedigree. Uh, it wasn't a sort of household name. He's come in. He's obviously done really well, and the fact that an NRL team have now come in and said, right, we're going to appoint you as head coach. Mm -hmm tells you how good he is and how he's matured as a coach over here. Uh, for St Helens, it's a big blow because uh, the guy is, is very good. Um, but nothing lasts forever. And um, if it's three years, which seems to have gone through very quickly, um, then they'll just find a replacement and they just move on to the next chapter. And that's just a fact of life. You don't have a coach for life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But no, you have to give credit to him for for what he's done is he's, he's 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 managed to get rid of some of the old guard as well so that's that's not been easy and he's found some great young players and he's developed some great players mm. as well um done very very well but ultimately he will be judged in this hard cruel world that we live in you know did he bring silverware so if in the end he wins a challenge cup or a grand final fantastic he will go down in history as a great great st helens mm. coach on the other hand, if they finish the season without any silverware and they've been a great team, top of the league, but they never actually won some major silverware, mm -hmm. then he might not get necessarily get the recognition. But right now, he's done very well. And they play a very exciting brand of rugby. Mm -hmm. Tim, on another note, he's going to a club that's by far been the worst team in the NRL this year and he's leaving the top team in Super League. Are we a little bit disappointed that he sees that as a bigger, more attractive job 
than staying with St. Helens. I think it is a shame. Obviously, we, we like to champion the English game, and rightly so. It, it mm -hmm. has come on leaps and bounds in that sense. But you've got to understand personal circumstance here as well. Obviously, it's a chance for him to go back home with his family as well. Mm -hmm. And and the NRL, it, it, it's a big proposition for any coach. He's a rookie coach in that sense. This is still a big chance for him to really progress his career in that sense down under again so mm. even though the titans are bottom of the nrl now struggling at the minute and there's a lot of talk about their future at the moment i think there's a lot of concern that maybe the titans are going to end up moving to possibly becoming a second team in brisbane by 2023 mm. so it's a big phase in the titans season at the moment in titans history so it's a bold move from the club themselves to actually turn to a rookie coach mm -hmm. to say you know you're the man to try and lead us forward and help practically save our future danny kerr so here's a question that I think will be the big talking point. Who next for St Helens? Adam Cuthbertson. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's uh, I think he's still got a little while left on his well, a year left on his career, hasn't he? Playing yeah, career. At least. Oh, I don't know. Do you do you go with a another Australian coach? You go with an English coach? You know, who wants that job of going into a the out and out best team in the league at the minute? That's a, some big shoes to fill, isn't it? Think of the harder teams to coach, though. <laughs> they Maybe. don't think they need much coaching at times. Well, yeah, they? there is that, isn't there? They're, yeah. they're full of outstanding players, so it, I guess it wouldn't be. But then with that, are they hard to coach because you've got so many characters and so many you know, highly skilled players? So oh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that job on anybody. I, I think I'd stick to playing and then maybe just go to uh, being a spectator again. But, yeah, there's... Um, I don't know. Who, who's who's going to step well, up to that? Well, where, would, where would you go, Richard? Would you, would you go Australia again or... Is there enough talent in the British game to to pluck someone from from over here? Maybe from another Super League club, maybe a free agent. I'd like to be a fly on the wall of the Saints boardroom with <laughs> Mike and Eamon shutting yeah. this through. Um, I think you know the, the appointment of a coach. I think is is critical. I mean, it's always important. But I think in this day and age, getting the right coach because what they'll want to see is continuity. Uh, Justin's obviously done a great job and. Sort of, let's hope you know from from Saints' point of view, they do win some silverware, um, but they won't want to go backwards now. Having sort of got to where they've got to, a great team, you know, they're in with a real chance of some silverware. You know, there's a lot of ambition in that Saints boardroom, and they'll want to make sure they get the right coach. I think they're probably a little bit. I think they probably didn't necessarily see it coming. They were probably hoping they would sign an extension. There hasn't been a lot of sort of rumours that they were in contract negotiations and he hadn't signed or he was going to sign. Um, obviously now it's, it's, he's heading out. Um, probably the difficult part maybe for St Helens now is, is that if you know that your coach is going to leave, say, in 12 or 18 months or 24 months, you can almost sort of groom somebody to take over. And so I think this has probably caught them a little bit unawares. Mm -hmm. Obviously the rumours have been there the last two or three weeks and Justin's batted it away quite cleverly. But um, do they stick with an Australian coach and you know it's not just because an Australian guaranteed to bring success or do they look at the home market here and there are some interesting sort of young coaches that are doing it you know in a very sort of different way and people like Ian Watson's done very well. You know, Richard Marshall's you know potentially got the chance there now mm -hmm. you know to to impose his own personality on, on the team. Um, and then you've got people like, like James Ford, who's done an incredible job at York. So, but St. Helens is a big, big club. So it's, you know, it's just that step up, isn't mm -hmm. it? But it's going to be an interesting one. There's some interesting names flowing into the ring. Speaking of Australian coaches, uh, another one who's been and left his post this year is Dave Fern. And now he spoke to League Express for the first time, his first interview since leaving the club. You've obviously worked with him since his departure what what can you tell us about the process that it's been through and obviously the i'm sure the agreement's been reached now which is why i'm speaking what, what exactly well, can my, you tell my legal firm has represented david um <coughs> in the last sort of probably three months really since the dismissal uh with a lot of talk in in general society about ndas and what does mm -hmm. it all mean but um there was a, a an agreement signed between the parties and unsurprisingly mm -hmm. there is strict confidentiality in terms of you know what happened and the termination process so i can't really go into detail mm -hmm. um, what i am pleased about is is that the matter has resolved itself because it did at one stage look like it could drag on a little bit uh, and credit to both parties so for david uh, and for leeds for resolving their differences um, 
I, I'm only repeating what David has said publicly. I think he was shocked by it. I think, you know, from his perspective, he saw it as a three year project. Uh, there was upheaval with his family where he left his wife and his youngest daughter in Sydney and they were planning to come over in June. And he knew that it was a big job and there was clearly, and it's a matter of public record, there's a rebuilding program going on down there. I don't think anybody would deny that. And he saw it as a three year rebuilding program where I think year one was going in there, just trying to sort out the way forward. It was no, I don't think these were ever gonna line up for silverware this year. But there is always that expectation. Um, I think probably where everyone got a bit of a shock was some of the poor kind of performances and poor results early mm -hmm. on. But in generally speaking, in, in, in Super League, um, there is stability with coaches and clubs. Mm -hmm. And leads of all the clubs actually sh have shown great loyalty to coaches. If, even if you look at Brian McDermott over the years, there was criticisms against yeah. him and question marks. And credit to, to Gary and the board, they stuck with Brian and it brought huge success. So I think it was the shock of, of, I don't think anybody saw it coming. I don't think even Leeds saw it coming. But it is what it is. These things are never easy. Um, you know, David kept his counsel. That's why really he never said anything until he gave that short interview when he left. It's a great shame for him. You know, I found him um, a real gentleman. He is a rugby league man through and through. It's in his blood. His father was an Australian coach, his brother works at Canberra Raiders. Uh, and I hope for his sake that he gets back on the horse, as we say, and he needs to get back coaching. Uh, and he's now back, he's probably, he flew back yesterday, so he's with his family. He probably just needs that period of just, right, what did go wrong and maybe, you know, lessons learned. But he's a good coach. And I think if you're a good coach, you'll get a job. Uh, during your time in rugby league, was it one of the easier cases that you've, you've dealt with? I know you've been in the game a long time and seen some very messy things over the years. Yeah, um, I think every every case has its own nuances and idiosyncrasies. Uh, I think for David, um, managing his kind of just thought process through this, I think the shock of what happened did affected him. It had an impact on his health. Um, I think the loneliness of being over here, um, trying to sort of fight his battle with his family back home in Australia was very, very difficult. But I always say with these things, there is a start, there's a middle and there's an end and, and common sense did prevail. And I think it's good for everybody because I think Leeds now need stability. I think, you know, they've just got to focus very hard now on avoiding relegation. Yeah. But it, it had its challenges, but I'm pleased in the end that common sense prevailed. Excellent. Well, after this short break, we will talk a little bit more about Leeds and the relegation battle in general, plus what exactly is going on at the Bradford Bulls. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Rugby League Bat Chat from the LD Nutrition Stadium. We're going to move the conversation on to Bradford. Um, look, not an easy one to cover this really because it's not a, a positive story and not one we want to see back in the public domain. But Richard, this, what we do know for a fact is there's been some county court judgments against the club. Mm -hmm. um, how, how serious is that? I think they come to around £2,600. Is this something to be majorly concerned about or not? It's difficult to say. I mean, if you can't just wake up one morning, open the post and find there's a county court judgment or a CCJ, mm. there's a process to go through where you get served with a claim form, you file a response and then you defend it if it's a contested matter. So I don't understand why a county court judgment would just end up 
being registered as it was. Um, but it is a worry. Now, it may well just be an administrative error. That could be as simple as that. And the easiest way to get rid of the county court judgment is to pay the judgment debt, apply to the court to get it removed, which is not a simple process. But then it's expunged from the record and then nobody would be any the wiser and actually it would be business as normal. But if it's more sinister than that, in that Bradford do not have the ability to pay creditors, then heaven forbid, because, um, I mean, I was involved in the last major issue with Bradford, which was the demise, I think, two or three years ago, um, which was probably the, one of the more difficult matters I've ever dealt with in Rupert Leaves. Mm -hmm. I had 45, 50 clients, all, all staff. So, you know, let, let's be optimistic that it's a blip and that Bradford are on the road to recovery mm -hmm. and it's business as normal because we, the game cannot afford another another bad episode of any form of insolvency, let alone mm -hmm. at Bradford. The other, the other thing that's been made of, Tim, is the fact that some of their central distribution money was was sent to other clubs as part of, because of ticket sales and stuff like that, just money that was owed. That's been paid off now, we, we believe, which is a good thing. But again, I guess the message here is it, it's just not a great look for the Bulls, is it? Especially given the previous that they've had. It's not a great look and I can imagine it's deeply concerning if you're a Bradford Bulls supporter because as Richard said there's been so many difficult times for them in recent years that they wake up and, and read the story and probably come mm. out in a cold sweat again thinking oh no not again because they've been through the mill so much over recent seasons and there's always that fear I suppose that once you've had those bad experiences in the past that they're going to come back again they're going to reform in some way and unfortunately for them it's, it's come out in this but as you said the amounts aren't as great so hopefully if they can pay that off it can prove that they are financially viable going forward and that the fans don't have to worry because i think that's the biggest thing for the supporters that are we going to still have a club are we still in problem and yeah. hopefully it shouldn't be the case how damaging could it be for the bulls and the image of the sport danica if if there is an issue again a, a big one because like richard we 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 need the Bradford Bulls, we need all of our clubs. We also don't need this sort of financial issue, do we, at a club like Bradford? I know you, 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 you automatically think of Bradford Bulls and, you know, and, and from when I was like a really big fan, well, I am a big fan, but of the sport, you know, the, the Super League days and the, mm -hmm. the big Bradford Northern derbies and things like that. And, and to see them come into this kind of state is, it, well, it's, it's sad first thing, you know, first and foremost, isn't it, that they've got to this level, but I think, Oddsell, as awful as it is, is just um, one of those places that you go and um, you love the fact that it's still very old school, it's still a bit tatty, it's still a bit um, run down, is that the right word? I don't know. But, um, I think so, but it's got its own charm. Yeah, but that's it? it. That's the part of the, it's yeah. part of the character, isn't it? When I when we played there with the girls, you know, somebody turned up and what we're doing, I was like, this is brilliant, like, <laughs> it's a time to play. But, um, you know, in terms of, the, of Bradford and the fans, you know, they're some of the most loyal, I think, um, that I've ever come across, uh, particularly when I played there for the women's team as well, they turn out for us, but you know, for them and, and the players there, it's just one of those that you really want them to pull through when this to be, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like you say, small amount, can this just be a blip, can this be covered and, and can they come through it? Because I think we can't really afford to lose another, another team in, in rugby league. We're a very mm -hmm. small northern outfit, aren't we? And uh, the more teams we get, the, the better our sport will be and the bigger it will grow. Richard, speaking of Oddsall, Andrew Chalmers has come out and said they might not play at Oddsall next year. There's mm. talk that they could go to Dewsbury Rams. Mm. There's talk they could go to Bradford Park Avenue. Mm. What, what's, what are we thinking when we hear that? Well, it's, I suppose it's just balancing the books, isn't it? What we don't know, and it's, there's obviously the Rugby Football League, as I understand it, still are the freeholder, so they're the owners mm. of Oddsall. Um, and then presumably Bradford pays some kind of rental income, so it's on a lease. But you know, it's what's what's behind there. What the bar takings? Who gets what there? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, if you had Bradford Bulls in Super League, you know, and you could recapture those great sort of derby matches and all the fighting that used to go on with mm -hmm. Jimmy Lowe's and Stuart Field and Jamie Peacock and uh, it was brilliant. We just, those are just great sort of Good Friday games that we're getting 20, 22,000. Then it, no, if it, no matter how run down it is, it doesn't really matter, it was no. perfect. But if it's a club that's going to be living in the championship and he's not going to get into Super League, then clearly it's not the right house, it's not the right 
accommodation but for do you think Bradford. The, the ticket price comes into to play. Like, you know, we played a curtain raiser for the men a few weeks ago, and it was twenty five pounds a ticket to watch our game on the men's. Like, like the day that somebody pays twenty five pounds to watch a wins game is a day that we know we've made it. Yeah. You know, and so just for for our fans alone to come and watch, I think that's if for a championship club. What is should there be a a ticket in price set in order well, to? Well, that's for family four. Uh, without kids discount whatever, that's a hundred pounds. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. To watch Bradford family. and so, Swinton. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, we, we know we can only. I don't know what the. Well, I don't know what the business plan is. Mm -hmm. um, it may well be a lot of bluff because clearly, if Bradford are in negotiations with the RFL, or they want a lower rental mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, obligation, then um, maybe that's the bluff. It could be a negotiation to say, look. You know, we're going to leave here. You'll have a white elephant. You'll have a, a, a rug, you'll have a, a property mm -hmm. with nothing with nothing to do out of it. And I think there is certainly. I know there's a covenant for it to be used for rugby league purposes. But where Andrew Chalmers and his board have got a bit of a, an advantage is is that um, there are other options in the area. So I'm not necessarily. I don't necessarily see them going to Dewsbury because I don't think it's big enough. Mm -hmm. But um, you potentially got. Um, Bradford City, Valley Parade. Although. That'd be too expensive though. Well, that it, probably could be, and you're probably, again, more suitable for Super League. And if you look at the accounts last time out, I think they'd lost over half a million quid. Yeah. Can they really afford to go to a stadium like Valley Parade if they're having to leave Odsall? Yeah, I mean, it's again, you'd probably say Valley Parade was suitable for Super League, mm. but um, but uh, Bradford Park Avenue is clearly another option. I don't know what that capacity is, but I think there is a connection there, actually, uh, between... Bradford Park Avenue. I think the chief executive there has got a strong connection with Bradford Bulls. So, you know, there may be some discussions and they might be on the move. And I think as long as it stays within the Bradford conurbation, mm -hmm. then, you know, it might not be a bad thing. And, and you know, it might well be that um, it's suitable for championship, but we don't know. Well, Andrew Chalmers, if you are uh, watching, we'd love to get you on the show to ask all these questions to you. Let's uh, move on. We're going to have to talk about the bomb Super League. Um, it's heating up. I think it's fair to say that, Tim, Leeds Huddersfield, I think we said nearly every week on the show, is this the biggest game of the season? For Leeds and Huddersfield, probably is the biggest game of the season so far, isn't it? It's a huge game. I don't think you can really put it into words just how big a game this is. I mean, we've had some incredible games between Huddersfield and Leeds in the past. I mean, there's that iconic Ryan Hall try where the Super League trophy was mm -hmm. in the sky in a helicopter circling the stadium waiting to come down. And this is going to be equally as big for different reasons in that sense, because yeah. these are two teams that are really fighting for their lives at the moment in terms of their form, in terms of league position. They'll be desperate to get a victory under their belts. Add into the fact it's a West Yorkshire derby as well. It has all the ingredients really to be a, an absolute firecracker. Danica, you, as you mentioned, get to speak to Leeds players a lot. Um, What's their attitude like? Do, do they come across as a team that's in a relegation battle at the minute or are they fairly relaxed? Um, I wouldn't say they're relaxed, you know, look, there's, there's a, a lot of stake, isn't there? Um, but I think with the, the new addition of the players, I think uh, with Richard Agar coming in, more consistency, you know, just settling yeah. down a little bit. I think there's been an air of, um, relax is not quite the right, right word to use, but, you know, that consistency coming through, the, the players, the... the they're a bit more kind of consistent in their training and what mm -hmm. they're doing. And I think performance wise, we might not have always got the win, but I think as a performance, generally, I think Leeds have looked to be better and, mm -hmm. and go forward. And I think like, you know, th this this week's going to be a brilliant game for the for the two of them and so important. And it just depends now who, I know it's that cliche thing of who turns up on the day thing, but that is with Leeds. You know, they've got the, the talent pool, they've got the skill to contest with the, the bigger teams in Super League. It just depends on how it goes on the day, I think. And Myla having uh, Robin there in, with his halfback connection mm -hmm. now, I think that's much better. And, you know, bringing in Reese and and another, you know, just big some powerhouses through the middle and driving forward and having Trent now as captain who, who really does lead by heart, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, put his skill aside, the passion and the heart that guy's got to, to lead his team forward. He's ready to put his body on the line. So I think mm -hmm. more of that going forward. And I think... We might be able to scrape through. And Who would have thought, start of the season, <laughs> Leeds well, Huddersfield on a, almost a relegation? You'd have thought, you know, this should be for top five, shouldn't I it? Know. Well, you, uh, even, oh, I, I just, I'm fed up trying to predict things with this sport anymore because you just can't do it. But on Huddersfield, they're two points clear at the minute of the bottom three. If they win, are they safe? 
think so. Yeah. Yeah, we all agree. The confidence they'll get yeah. as well from beating Leeds. And, mm. uh, but the interesting aspect is, is, you know, London will be looking at their fixture list and with all due respect to Salford, who've been phenomenal this year. You know, Watson's done a great job, galvanised a great team. But London will be thinking, this is a bit of an opportunity for us. Just get them on a, get them down there on that pitch and just on a slight off day. Uh, uh, Danny Ward will be thinking this is a potential two points. Well, I think we'd be foolish to try and predict any result in Super League this year because it's just bonkers. But you would have to say London at home to Salford is a bit more likely than Saints who play Wakefield at home. I mean, Wakefield aren't playing great anyway. Hull can have a tough game as well. As, as Richard said, London, this could be the moment to get off bottom and put Hull KR slash Leeds in all sorts of trouble. And Wakefield, isn't it, Tim? Absolutely. For London, if this is a chance for them to get off the bottom of the table, then again, what a job that Danny Ward has done this season. Because I think many thought that they wouldn't even be in with a fight. They wouldn't even be in with a chance of getting out of that relegation mm -hmm. spot at the bottom of the table. And he's done a, a re remarkable job, really, in terms of their season as a whole. I worry a little bit for Wakefield at the moment. I really hope yeah. I'm wrong. Um, but Wakefield's struggling to find any form at the moment. When you look at Leeds, as Danica says, with Richard Agar at the moment, they're always in games, they're always tight games. Even if they do lose, it's, it's not by many points. But Wakefield at the moment just really seems to be struggling to, to keep games tight in that sense. And Wakefield as well, Danica, they've still got the top four to play. And then they've got Hull KR away and London at home. That it's is not a great run, is it? And they've got injuries and they're short, they're short and I've, on troops. I've, I've, I think yeah. if we're honest, Probably players that are playing injured as well. David Fafita looks like one yeah. who is injured. And they've injured. been battered around the box, haven't they? They've Confidence-wise, it's not going to do them much. No. You know, and it's hard for me to say this as a, a Rhinos player and supporter, but there's part of me that really wants them to do it. Well, right, of here's a there. question. I ask this every week, and I'm sure everyone who watches this <laughs> show is fed up. Is anyone willing to say that London will stay up? I'm going for it. Wow, I think you may be the first one. Tim? I'm going to say it. <sighs> Not yet. Everybody loves an underdog. No. I, I, it's, I been the story, the it's been the year of the underdog of the so week. far. They've signed a player, haven't they, as well? Brock Lamb has come yes. from uh, Sydney Roosters. Not had much luck there playing-wise, but he played a lot of Newcastle last year. Um, has proved that he can play. Is he here? Is he ready to play? He's ready to go. Playing this week. Yep. The, well, this is an interesting one, actually, Richard, because um, you also do a bit of player agency. The transfer deadline is a week tomorrow. How much business are we expecting at the bottom of Super League, the top of the championship as well? Uh, not a lot, I don't think. Okay. And the reason I say that is because um, if you're a top club and you're in the top five, top six, mm. why would you want to be selling any of your players? Um, so there's a lot to play for. Because of the nuances of the relegation fight that we've got this year, which nobody kind of really thought would happen. So even clubs like bottom four, bottom five are potentially in a relegation fight. So ordinarily, if let's say London were mathematically down now, they haven't won a game all season, then you may well see players being offloaded or, or yeah. there is transitions through in terms of transfers. So the bottom clubs will definitely be wanting to see if they can recruit. Uh, they may even look to the championship to get some extra troops on board because you know they're coming to the business end of the season. The top clubs don't like selling players to the top clubs. Mm -hmm. Why would they? It just improves their chances. So we may see a little bit of movement, um, but even the clubs in the championship, clubs like Toronto, Lee, whatever, they will be wanting to make sure they've got the best squads available. Mm -hmm. Tim, we are very, very, very short of time. But just quickly, George Burge has got a Wigan. How big for Super League? And it's, for Wigan? Oh, it's massive. Absolutely massive for Wigan. Ab absolutely massive for the Super League as well to be able to attract a high-caliber player like him in the prime of his career as well, 27. So he's still got plenty of years in him to mm -hmm. bring a talent like that to the Super League. I think it just shows how much the English game is growing at the minute. Yeah, I agree, Tim. He's, obviously, George Burge is great. We've got Gareth Widdup. Um, I've already forgot them all. Sasaya Feke, Ma Heifanua, Manu Mao. I'm sure I've done someone a disservice by missing them there. There's a lot of good players coming over from the NRL. We can safely say, can't, can't we? Right, that's all we've got time for. Let's end on that positive note. Don't forget, you can join the conversation too on Twitter at RL Batch. And if you've got any questions for us in the next week's show, feel free, get in touch. A big thank you to my guests, Richard, Tim and Danica. You can see I'm assured that tattoo on Twitter. That's all we have time for now. A big thank you from all of us here on Rugby League Batch. For now, Goodbye.